Today we're going to talk about climate change, um, a little bit about water rights, and we're going to talk about how all of this affects flow in our rivers. And what we're looking at is a map of temperature change over the past 100 or so years, a little bit more than 100 years, so 1895 to 2019. And these are data compiled by NOAA, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They handle all of the climate data for the country and weather data. Um, and what it's showing is that in this particular area, so there's junction kind of right in the middle of the bullseye, a little bit in Wyoming as well, we're in a climate change hotspot. The temperature has gone up, um, up to three degrees Celsius in some areas, which is um, getting close to five degrees Fahrenheit on average over time. And what does that mean? It's getting hotter. Well, hotter summers, right? More heat waves, that kind of thing. Um, but it has a really big implication on water and flow, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Oh boy. There we go. I want to acknowledge Brad Udall. He's a senior water scientist at Colorado State University. Um, a lot of these the information in these slides came from him. Um, this is a guy who's studying, kind of bringing the science together with the policy people and doing a lot of good stuff. So the article that I posted for today's lecture is, um, this is a, an image from this. And if you um, have spent any time driving between here and Delta, you'll recognize this uh, as there's the Grand Mesa right there. We're kind of looking north at the Grand Mesa. And here's that Manco Shale kind of deserty stuff, similar to the book cliffs. And here's a farmer. He, um, he and his family make uh, produce alfalfa and hay. And this story kind of centers around their particular story and the bigger picture of what climate change is doing. So two degrees Celsius beyond the limits, um, the climate change hotspot that's robbing the west of its water. The Washington Post article from two years ago now, or a year ago now. And so this gentleman, his name's Paul Kenmeyer. Um, They've been living through what is now known as a 20 year long drought, kind of starting right around year 2000. Some folks are call it, calling it the millennium droughts, 21st century drought. Um, and year to year, we've had some variability, right? We had that huge snow year that happened in 2019, 2019. Um, and that, that might be the case. We might get a, a decent snow year, but at the end of the day, if you look at the long-term trends over the last 20 years, it's been hotter, it's been drier, and the flows have been much lower. So in 2018, they had a really bad year. They, um, in their 70 year history of farming, their farm years were about 10, fields were about 10% of normal. And in 2020, we had about 100% of our snowpack. Remember, our snow is our water supply in Colorado. So we got 100% of snowpack, 100% of average, right? Kind of over the last 30 years. But only 50% of average runoff. So we can record the snow in the mountains, and then we can record the river flows and compare those two, compare those two records. So there's something going on here where even if we have normal uh, snow, a snow year, skiing's descent, whatever, the river flows are, are reducing. So here's that climate change uh, hot spot again. And what we're beginning at is how these increasing temperatures are affecting our, our river flows. So this is kind of a hydrology type of lecture. So before we get into the real mechanisms, let's do some basics here and do some kind of understanding of, of what climate change means, how it plays out, and what the difference, first of all, is between climate and weather. So climate um, is kind of a long-term, well, actually, let's talk about weather first. So weather is, you know, what, what did it do today? Um, when we're on the river, it froze overnight. Um, many of us had some numb feet. It's frost that we're dusting off the tents and sleeping bags. Um, it, then it went up to 70 degrees, right? Or 60 degrees or something that day. So here's our little uh, hiker and she says it's 90 today. Good thing I brought lots of water. Weather is the manifestation of climate on a particular day. So this is showing the highs and lows over the course of a year. 
And we know that, um, you know, in April, we can have a warm day in October, or sorry, in, um, you know, June, maybe we can have a really cold day, right? There's a lot of variability in the weather based on what's happening with the jet stream, et cetera. It's kind of this chaotic thing. Um, but climate is the overall trend that we superimpose on that. So the averages, what's the average high, the average low over say the last 30 years? So climate is, um, well, you know, in August, if I look ahead, then um, it's probably gonna be in the 90s here in Junction. So if I have a trip I'm planning, make sure we're bringing lots of water and hats and all that good stuff. So climate change and weather are certainly connected and climate and weather are connected, um, but it's really hard to point to climate change as causing a particular event. So Hurricane Harvey, does anyone remember that? It was it, it flooded Houston, um, pretty devastating. This is not Houston, but this is another flood. Um, and you can't necessarily point to Hurricane Harvey and say, oh, Hurricane Harvey happened because of climate change, global warming. But you can zoom out and say at a global level, air is hotter, it holds more water. We can expect to have more extremes, more events, more fires like we're seeing in California and even Colorado, hurricanes that are stronger and produce more rain. Um, and in fact, someone um, did a really sophisticated weather model of Hurricane Harvey and basically said, okay, here's the existing temperature and water supply. When this happened, if we went back, turn the clock back 80, uh, I think they did 50 years, um, when the average temperature was cooler, what would Hurricane Harvey have done? So they played that kind of basically playing guy but with a computer model. And they found that I think it was on the order of 20% of the rainfall that came out of Harvey was attributed to the increase in temperature because warmer air holds more water. So you can, you can do that as well. So here's just a, a graphic of um, averages of climates on the Western slope, average lows, average highs and temperature by month and then average precipitation. So we can, we, and this is based on just going back and, and basically averaging over the noise of, of weather data of what happened on a particular day. And when we think about climate, we typically refer to what's normal, what's average. It was hotter than average today. This was the, um, you know, we're 10% above average or something like that. On average in October, we have one inch of rain or something like that. And that's based off of what we call climate normals. Climate normals are something that are developed by um, NOAA. Here's NOAA again, I love their symbol. I don't think it's a bird, maybe it's a wave or maybe it's a bird and a wave. Um, and they are the, the agency that kind of keeps track of all the data. And every 30, every, sorry, every 10 years, they update it based on the last 30 years. So um, what we're seeing here, the temperature, average temperature across the whole country, based on all the little weather stations that we have at airports, et cetera. And they're saying, okay, if we took the average temperature across the whole country, over from 1900 to 2020, how do these change? How do these compare to the average temperature? And so we can see that it was colder in the 1930s. It was actually a lot wetter. This is when the Colorado River Compact was made. Um, and then in the last 30 to 40 years, it's been a lot warmer, especially in the Southwest. You can see that hot spot there. But these normals are 30 year intervals that move every 10 years. So just uh, we just got rid of 2020, get rid of it. And now we updated the new climate normal from 1991. And we get one inch of rain in October. It was based off of this time period, this average. So as we adjust the climate normals, these averages, we also can see the trends that are happening over these, these 10 year periods. The last climate normal was 1981 to 2010. The new one is now 1991 to 2020. And here's the change in temperature. So, over the, um, now that we switched to Period. 
Here's the change in precipitation. Um, they're showing that it's actually drying out, not raining as much in the southwest. It's actually getting wetter in this area in uh, Montana. Good for them. Thanks. Wyoming a little bit. So let's dig, let's dig in a little bit into um, what's happening with as our planet warms up. Um, this is uh, an understanding of the greenhouse effect, which we're going to be talking about here. It's something that we've known from a theoretical standpoint in experiments. Um, you can take a little glass of atmosphere and put carbon dioxide in and see how much energy it traps, right? So physicists were doing this um, for over 100 years. But here's a, a balance, this is the global energy balance. And if you take weather and climates or um, some of the more natural resources classes, you might see something like this. We're gonna, we're gonna do a real brief introduction. And the way this works is we've got energy coming in from the sun, radiation. Um, what kind of energy comes from the sun? When you stick your arm out and feel that heat on your arm, you get that sunburn. What's going on? What kind of energy is coming in? UV, okay, so that's, that's energy coming from the sun. So it gives us our, our nice tan, so we not sunburns. Well, what other kind of energy? What can we see? Visible light, and then there's one more. What can we feel on our skin? You actually can't feel UV. Infrared. infrared. So that's the heat, like a heat lamp, right? Infrared. So you get three different kinds of energy coming from the sun. They're all part of the spectrum, right? It's all on the spectrum. And so that's how much energy is coming in. It's watts per meter squared. You don't have to worry about that. But you can leave it as a light bulb, right? A 60 watt bulb, a 90 watt bulb. That's how much energy is coming in. Some of it gets bounced off the atmosphere and reflected to space. That's why you have that um, the ozone layer, right? We don't have that ozone hole where the UV comes in. Um, but the visible light comes through and the um, infrared comes through. And it gets reflected around. Some of it um, comes off the surface and goes into the atmosphere. And then that atmosphere reflects it back. This is the blanket. This is our carbon dioxide, our methane, our ozone. They reflect a lot of energy back and just comes back in the form of infrared radiation heat. So when you put a blanket on yourself, you're kind of trapping the air. Has anyone used those um, those mylar kind of silvery blankets, emergency blankets? You know what I'm talking about? Um, they're really thin and it's basically like a like a balloon material. If you wrap yourself in that, it's a mirror you're putting around yourself, it's reflecting. Your heat back on you. It's not giving you any insulation, but it's just reflecting your heat. So that's the same way the greenhouse gases work. Um, they, they happen to absorb and reflect heat back to us. And when we increase greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and some others, we basically thicken that blanket. We pile on another comforter. So we're reflecting more energy back, and we're increasing the back radiation. We are um, Basically, this is the water cycle here. This is energy that leaves the earth in, um, in, in terms of water. So water vapor coming off the earth and raining back down. So we're kind of speeding up the water cycle as well. Let's watch a quick video on the kind of other, there's a lot of information that helps us understand why climate change is happening and what the reasons are behind it. So I've got a short video that does that. Hi, I'm Alex here. Uh, oh, all right, sorry, Alex, go for it. Hi, I'm Alex here. Is climate change really human-made? There's been a lot of research and reports published over the years, and I don't blame you if you don't want to read it all. So here's what we know for sure in three minutes. Let's get drawing. It all started in 1998 when an ice drilling project was undertaken in the Russian Vostok station in Antarctica. The project yielded the deepest ice core ever recovered, giving access to ice that was 427 year old at a depth of 3,623 meters. It supplied data about atmospheric composition and climate through four climate cycles. So here is how it all works. The formation of the glaciers results from the transformation of water into ice. 
During this process, which can last thousands of years, sediments, air, and rocks are stuck into the ice, making millions of layers, one above the other, in chronological order. Over the time, the glacier becomes a million-page history book with the last chapter on the top. The deeper you drill, the older the compounds are. The ice core gave access to climate data, including local temperature, precipitation rate, wind strength, etc. But also, and this is what we are interested in here, the ice core provided direct records of past changes in atmospheric trace gas composition, thanks to their entrapped air inclusions. Then it was possible to determine the levels of carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane, CH4, at a given time. So here is what global temperature and atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane look like over four climate cycles, 427 years. So you can clearly see the four climate cycles, and you also see that they have very similar spikes and patterns. There is clearly a relationship between temperature, carbon dioxide, and methane. The upper and lower boundaries of the three variables are tightly constrained, which is typical of a self-regulating system. Our body is also a self-regulating system and does something similar in a way. When you exercise, your body sweats as a way to regulate its temperature. Well, on Earth, when concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane go up, global temperature goes up too. Now, here's what happened with the concentration of atmospheric CO2 since 1960. It increased by about 70 parts per million, that is more than one part per million each year, indicating significant human perturbation in the self-regulating system of Earth since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. As this concentration is now way over the upper boundary noted during the last 427 years, and as the Earth seems to be a self-regulating system, well, we can expect the global temperature to increase as well, and we are already seeing this worldwide. Since the Vostok research was published, more recent ice cores were performed by the European Project for Ice Coring in Antarctica, the EPICA. They provided data for the last 800,000 years and confirmed the findings in Vostok. So, as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change simply puts it in their 2013 report, human influence on the climate system is clear, and we can safely say that we, human beings, are responsible for climate change. So please subscribe to learn more about sustainability through short animation videos, and thank you for watching. So that's one kind of source of data and information, these ice cores, little bubbles in the ice trap atmosphere and it gets into some real science but um, the way it works is the ratio of isotopes so you know what isotope is how many um, neutrons and protons a particular atom has you can have oxygen that has a little bit heavier and oxygen that's a little bit lighter and the ratio of lighter and heavier oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules is um, tied directly to temperature so that's how we extrapolate out um, but it's not just temperature that's changing over time. So here is our temperature. I'm just going to put this real quick. Here's our temperature trend uh, from 1850, uh, global average. And this is anomaly. It just means your, your difference from average. Are we above average or below average? Um, sea surface temperatures are increasing. The air over the sea, sea level is increasing as well. Um, as water gets hotter, it expands. We also have more water that is in liquid form versus ice form. And then our summer Arctic sea ice extent is going down. So the, the Arctic and Antarctic ice is melting. All right, so just a couple more things about climate change. Um, yes, the climate is always changing, right? We saw those 100,000 year cycles. We actually linked those, this is, this is cool, where climate change comes in with um, basically astronomy, I guess. Um, our planet wobbles and wiggles. And so over a 100,000 year cycle, called the Milankovitch cycle, it gets a little bit closer and a little bit farther away from the sun. 
And so when it's a little bit farther away, it's a little bit colder. CO2 levels go down, temperature goes down, it's a little closer, it gets hotter. But as we saw from that ice core record and modern day data, we're well outside of the envelope of that, that 100,000 year cycle in terms of temperature and carbon dioxide. Well, it was a cold winter, right? We had this massive snow event. There's no way we're having uh, global warming. Um, weather, climate change doesn't mean it's always hot all the time. Certainly, as we go along, we're going to have more hotter days and fewer colder records. But for every four warm records or heat records that we set in the last decade, we get one cold record. Um, so we're, we're going in that direction. Um, and as the air heats up, it holds more water, we're going to get more variable weather. Um, so we can, have, we can still have big, huge rain events. We can still have big, huge snow events. So the variability overall is increasing. Um, some people say, well, we can't predict the weather, so how can we predict climate? Again, we have these long-term data sets so we can see what happens. Um, and then climate models are garbage. Well, it depends on what you ask them, but they all show based on the physics that um, in the next 100 years, we're gonna continue this warming trend. So how do we link this then to the water cycle? This is what we're interested in for this class. The water cycle, hopefully you've seen this in elementary school or high school. Rain falls on the mountains or, or snow, it melts, goes into the groundwater, it goes into a river and a stream, a lake, and eventually the ocean. All the meanwhile, it's evaporating, either directly from the water or transpiring from plants. And it goes back into the sky as condensation rains back down. So as we increase the temperatures, we are changing so many things in this water cycle. This is ultimately a heat driven cycle, right? A solar driven cycle. And when our heat increases in the air, we have more potential to hold water in the air. You can kind of think of hot and humid, right? Florida is really humid, it's hot. Um, you can hold a lot more water in the air when it is hot. Here it's hot and dry, we just don't have a lot of water around, right? But we have the potential to hold more water. Um, it can influence the type of precipitation. Are we going to get rain or snow? On the Mesa, it flat, it, the maximum elevation is between 10 and 11,000 feet, which is a little bit above that. But that elevation range is really sensitive to um, do we get snow or rain up there? Right now, if you look out, you can see that way um, that we have snow on the Mesa, right? But maybe um, we're going to be getting more rain up there than snow. Um, the frequency, do we have more dry days or longer droughts? Um, and just kind of intermittent rainfall here. And then more heat ultimately means more evaporation. Evaporation obviously is just water coming off your skin or a lake or the ground. And the hotter it is, the more thirsty the air is to pull that water out. So more water is leaving our soil, our water, and our snowpack given that big increase in heat. Um, and then this leads to a lot of other things, uh, more fires, dust on snow. This makes the snow darker, which allows it to absorb more energy and melt. Um, this can impact our water quality. If it's warmer and there's less oxygen in the water, we can have more algal blooms. And it can change the timing of our, our snow melt. So if snow melts earlier, then we have an earlier runoff and lower later season flows um, in the late summer and fall. So there's a lot of trickle down effects. Now, what's gonna happen in the future isn't necessarily tied to the past. And that's what makes it hard for engineers and planners to really plan and, and make predictions for how to build things and manage our water systems and our rivers in the future. What the work that we do as engineers is based on this idea of stationary. Everything is stable. So if we look at the stream flows for the last 30 years or 100 years, then we can make some calculations on the average flow, the peak flow, the low flows, that kind of thing, and use that to maybe build a bridge or a reservoir for the future. But with climate change, everything's changing. So looking back at the past might not be valid and making decisions based on past data might not be valid for the future. So we have this idea of stationary is dead. This was an article put out a while ago now. And this idea is we can't assume all of our assumptions about the past no longer are valid. And so it makes water management really challenging. 
On top of that, we have supply and demand exchanging. And then as we manage our reservoirs, then we're going to talk um, on Thursday about uh, different mechanisms to share water, move water around. That makes it a lot harder because this is all based on past data. So our designs and our new water projects are going to be less certain. We're going to have to build that uncertainty into our management. So going back to that Washington Post article, here are the temperature trends, um, the increases in, in temperature across the country, some decreases down here. Um, but we're, we're right there in the hot spot. So let's bring it down a little bit closer to Colorado and the Western Slope. Um, here is the average trend across the country in temperatures from 1895 to 2019. And here's Mesa County. So here's that trend line fits the Mesa County data. So plus one degree Celsius over the last 100 plus years, 125 years. Mesa County is at plus 2.3 Celsius, which is about four degrees Fahrenheit. Might not feel like a big deal. Um, but what it means is we're going to have, we already are having longer heat waves, more extreme heat waves, warmer uh, winters, and that kind of thing. The average is kind of an indication of the general trend, but it's really the extremes that, that play out in our lives. Here's that, another temperature signal, temperature trend for Colorado. And these are differences from average. So here's the average line. And then it was cooler in the early part of the century and a lot warmer, um, pretty much primarily warmer than average in the latter part. But when we look at rainfall, there's not a lot of good trends. Um, these are climate change projections for 2035 to 2065 in the Western US. And it's not showing a big signal. The, the projections are showing a big temperature increase but not necessarily a big change in precipitation. But even if precipitation holds steady, we're still seeing this reduction in flows. And let's dig into why that is. Um, all right, we're gonna look at these graphs right here. And we're seeing the kind of annual flows in the river in black. Here's kind of a smooth trend line of flows. And then here is the trend line. Um, from 1900 to 2010. And this is an article from Brad Udall and, and Jonathan Overpack. And what they're showing is that overall in the Colorado Basin, the flows are reducing. So this is upper Colorado Basin flows, basically what goes into Lake Powell. Not by a huge amount, but you can kind of see this trend, right? It's below average, this black dotted line is average. The rainfall or snow in the upper basin, they go up and down, but there's not a huge trend line there, right? That, red trend line is right on top of the average. But of course, we're seeing temperatures increase in the last um, 20, 30 years. And so what they argue is that we're having what's called a hot drought. Um, these, these brown lines show two different drought periods. So 1960s, 1950s, we had um, low flows, we had low precipitation, right? Below average precipitation. So this was a dry drought. Lack of snow, lack of rain, lack of river flows. Here we are um, in kind of average precipitation overall, low river flows, but higher temperatures. So in this case, we have what's called a hot drought, not a dry drought, but a hot drought. Even with average precipitation, the extra heat is sucking that water out of the atmosphere, out of the snowpack, and causing reduced flows in the river. So dry drought, low flows, low precipitation, average um, temperatures. So it's the precipitation that's linked to the drought. So, and drought meaning manifesting as flows in rivers. That's what irrigators care about, right? That's what cities care about. And hot drought, temperature driven. Um, stable precipitation, increased temperatures and lower flows. And this is playing out um, in the data. Here's another kind of way to look at it. Um, here's the flow on the y-axis. So each point is an average kind of volume of flow coming out, million acre feet. And here is uh, the average precipitation in the upper basin from October to May. This is kind of a snow period, right? And so there's a pretty good linear relationship. If you look at blue, it's all the data compiled together. 
So basically how much rain and snow came down in the basin on the x-axis can predict then how much flow you get coming out of the basin. But if we just take the last 20 or so years, so 2019 and fit a line to it, it's shifted over. So say we had 10 inches of precipitation, instead of getting, um, if we go up to the blue line, we come over, we get about say 13 million acre feet. Now we're just getting about 11, right? So there's this gap, this difference related to that hot drought concept. Um, and this, this is the same paper um, by Brad Udall is about one third of the decline and our flows is due to, the, to, due to global warming. So some other lines of evidence, this was another reading, we're just gonna scroll through it real quick. And this is getting at um, this, this kind of mega drought that we're calling it now that we've had in the 21st century. I thought this was a, a fun article, so I wanted you guys to take a look at it. It'll load for us. Great. All right, so this is um, based on tree ring data. Has anyone counted tree rings? What did you do with your childhoods? <laughs> um, there's a, a cottonwoods are really fun. There's one in um, connected lakes that recently they cut down and you know, you kind of go back through those tree rings and you just like, this, this cottonwood's been through some shit, you know, there's like some really good years and there's some really dry years. Um, and if we think about tree rings and we'll, we'll look at it in a second, um, it's basically a record of how wet it was. You know, you could imagine that a tree it's going to grow and do really well in a wet year, and it's not going to grow too much in a dry year. So we've seen the wildfires in the news. We've experienced the smoke. Um, so this is connected to drought. Drought is lack of rain, higher temperatures, all these things. And we've had a lot of drought in the southwest and even the northwest in the last decade plus, which has led to fires. So trying to go back and understand, very much similar to those ice cores, we can use tree rings to tell us some, some information, not necessarily about the gas content, but how much water was around and in the soil. So there's a bioclimatologist, that's a cool name, Park Williams, um, and they collected a huge database of tree rings. So this is, um, I think we collected a tree ring, I'm looking at my biology friends. It's this core that's basically like a metal straw with like a drill bit on it, and you just put it into a tree, and turn it and twist it. And it makes this little tiny um, core of wood that comes out. And then you shave it down, you sand it down and kind of glue it on. And then you can, with a microscope, measure the width of these tree rings. So each year is a record of how much the tree grew. Um, I did this in North Carolina and there's a lot of oak trees and they rot from the inside, kind of like Aspen. I was doing a tree core and I take it out and it just, use this future like 100 year old water at me is terrible um don't pour oak trees but in in the west we have these really old trees bristle cone trees and some other conifers that can be around for 2000 years so you know in the time of jesus they were they were growing out here um so here and then we can date it back right count backwards to get the dates and the thickness of that tells us how moist, how much you know, precipitation snow was around. So here's 1980, and here is the last decade. Look how narrow those are. So you can relate the tree ring data to other climate data like soil moisture and precipitation. And then line up an old tree with an older tree and even older tree, and then make the record go all the way back so here are the sites where they have tree ring data in the West. Um, and then they're able to plot basically soil moisture levels based on the tree ring data. And when they see really narrow tree rings and really dry soils, then they can find basically droughts. And we've seen big droughts in the past, um, but what they're finding is the current drought is essentially about 46% of the severity of it. So it's a little bit greater outside of the normal um, range of variability. 
And so that's what's attributed then to fossil fuels and human activities. So this mega drought, we would be in a drought right now because of climate cycles, whatever other reasons, um, but it's made, being made worse because of climate change and increasing temperatures. So here's that same study. This is the actual journal article in Science, um, which is the kind of preeminent science magazine uh, journal out there. And here's the reconstruction of the data. Uh, we've had a big drought in uh, around 1900. Um, the record goes all the way back to 800 AD. So um, yeah, pretty long time ago, right? What are we doing in 800 AD? Were we still in caves? Uh, Middle Ages. Middle Ages. Dark. Okay, so we had Dark Ages. Yeah. Um, and this is North America, but uh, 1200, uh, big drought, or 1100, um, 1300, 1600. This is the worst one on record. And we're right at this level here in 2000. So this is why they're calling it a mega drought, because this kind of once in, wow, 400 plus years, and we had a drought this extreme in terms of the level of dryness. Um, so number one was back in late 1500s, and this is basically the drought rank or soil moisture. And then early 2000s um, to now is the uh, current current status. Number two. So our period right now is the second driest since 800 AD from the tree ring record. And based on their studies, they did some modeling um, as well as um, looking at the soil data and the tree ring data, determined that about 50% of the severity of the drought is due to our global warming and the regenic warming from greenhouse gases from fossil fuels. So without the increasing greenhouse gases, we would be at a moderate drought, not a severe mega drought. So that kind of gets back at you know, Hurricane Harvey, right? Hurricane Harvey wouldn't have happened without global warming. It just happened to dump about 20% more rainfall over Houston than it would have. All right, I'm almost done with graphs, I promise. Um, last study here, and it's showing just the recent trends in the Colorado Basin. So here's a, a graph of precipitation. We saw this before. Precipitation is flat in the basin. It's going up, it's going down. But if you draw a trend line over the last century, um, it's not, there's no big trend. Temperatures are increasing, we know that. We've got a record of that. Our snowpack is reducing. So this is basically how much water is in the snowpack on average. And um, it's uh, this, this term we use is snow water equivalent. We basically say, okay, we've got six feet of snow. How much of that is water? We melted it instantaneously, right? Um, snow is kind of fluffy and it packs down over time. So if we measure the weight of the snow and the volume, we can get the density. And then we can calculate based on the density of water, if we were to melt it all, how much water would come out of it. Does anyone know like approximately if it rain, you know, if it snows this much, how much water you get out of it? Like how much snow does it take to get an inch of water? It's about a foot. It depends on the density, right? How thick and fluffy it is or how um, dense it is, right? So um, here's another kind of weird one. The snow is absorbing more energy basically energy from the sun. And that's related to more dust on the snow. That makes it darker and melts more quickly. Um, and there's more energy kind of reflecting around in the atmosphere. Um, so there's more radiation coming in from that greenhouse effect. And um, ultimately evaporation is increasing, evapotranspiration. So what's coming out of the snowpack or water bodies and what plants are transpiring as it heats up. So finally, all these kind of things line up to say, well, discharge is decreasing. Flow rate's going down because we're losing more water out of the system, our, our snowpack's declining, and our temperature's going All right, now we're going to bring it home, last little bit here, to Colorado and flows in our river. No flows are going down. Let's just look at how we use our flows. When I say flows, um, we get our water out of the river. Rivers fill our reservoirs up and we divert water for agriculture. So I don't know if you knew this, but about 80%, 87% of our water goes to ag. Alfalfa, hay, corn, soybeans on the front range. Um, a little bit goes to municipal industrial, about 7%. 
Um, some of it's diverted for non-consumptive uses. Um, we, we bring it in and it goes back. And then some of it goes to industrial. But the vast majority is going to ag, which is a backbone of our economy here. On top of that, we have um, the Colorado River Basin Compact. So Colorado is a headwater state. We're required to send water down to um, Lake Powell and to Arizona, Nevada, and California by law. So it's a, a compact that was signed in 1922. Um, and we, by law, we have to send so much water downstream. It's um, seven and a half million acre feet on average over 10 years. And that was based off of the really early wet period that we had based in the 1920s, 1910s. Turns out there's not that much water in the river. Not that much water in, in, in the whole basin. Um, but right now it's written as law that we have to send it down. So that's a challenge. Um, do we think that water use will increase in our state? More population is certainly growing, right? Um, is it going to have to come at a cost to agriculture? That's been playing out in the front range, certainly, where water utilities will buy out farms it's called buy and dry. There's other options too. You can lease the water. We might be forced to send more water downstream to meet the compact requirements, uh, which would mean flow through the Grand Valley. It could be a good thing. That might be hard on Colorado because it mean, might mean we have to cut back our use. Um, this didn't update, so sorry about the typo, but um, there's some options that we can do here to reduce our consumption. And there's folks in the Grand Valley exploring this. So irrigation demand management. And this is basically trying to use less water to produce the same amount of crops. Right now we do a lot of flood irrigation uh, where water pours across the land. Uh, it uses a huge amount of water. But can we use kind of more targeted drip irrigation and spray to produce the same crops? The challenge is it's hard to quantify the savings in water. And irrigators are really sketchy. They don't want to, no, they're not sketchy, they're sketched out by it because they don't want to lose their water rights. They don't want to be forced to cut back their water use. Um, so they're very nervous about that. Um, we can follow, meaning not grow crops on irrigation land for a year or three years out of 10 and lease those water rights back into the river. I'm talking more about that on Thursday. But ultimately, we're going to have to renegotiate the Colorado River Compact because um, the, we're on the hook, the upper basin of Colorado, Wyoming, et cetera, are on the hook to send so much water downstream to California, Arizona, and Nevada. But there's just not as much water to go around as there was. So to close, climate change, is already impacting flows in our river. We've seen that in the data. Um, it will continue to get hotter. Um, some might call it a new normal. Others might call it a new abnormal because this is not, we're kind of outside of the human experience here, right? We saw those cycles going back hundreds of thousands of years. We're outside of that. We're going back to millions of years ago when dinosaurs roamed the planet and we had eight foot long centipedes in terms of our atmospheric conditions and temperature. Um, a centipede story is really cool. We actually had more oxygen in our air and bugs, their size is limited by the concentration of oxygen in the air. Um, so if we ever get more oxygen, look out for the, the massive cockroaches. <laughs> Did you have a question? No, just stretching. So we can expect more fires. We're already seeing that. And that can result in more sediment in our rivers, right? What happened in Glenwood Springs? fire, mudslides, right, right into the river. Um, and that sediment's gonna eventually make its way down to the Grand Valley, right? Um, we have a lot of information, right? We kind of know all these things are happening, but it's really hard to make a plan. There's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of inertia. It's hard to change direction. So I want you all to take, we've got about, um, we'll take about 10 minutes. <laughs> to um, write some thoughts down first and then discuss among yourselves and we'll bring it back to the class. Well, what does all this mean for the Colorado River and the Grand Valley? How will this impact recreation, development on the riverfront? And what can Grand Junction, Mesa County do? What can a specific business owner do to 
plan for this, to address this, or to, are they just gonna react and kind of have to deal with the consequences? So take a few minutes to kind of write some thoughts down and then we'll, we'll discuss amongst ourselves and then in, uh, together in class.